The Spanish flu of 1918 through 1919 was a global disaster cited as the most devastating pandemic in recorded world history. At the time, the world population was at 1.8 billion. In only a matter of eight weeks, the virus executed approximately 20 million people and debilitated an additional 1 billion men and women. The everyday lives of millions of people were affected in many political, economic, social, and of course health-related ways to hamper the spread and eventually end the Spanish flu of 1918. The specific place of birth of the pandemic is still unknown to this day, though many theories lurk about. The influenza virus from the catastrophe of 1918 was H1N1, a type of swine flu that travels through the air. This means that the virus was transmitted from a pig to a human, and through the human, the virus continued to spread with the help of constantly moving soldiers, who were already in poor conditions. This type of influenza also settles deep within the lungs, causing pneumonia and, in effect, the immune system to create a strong attack. The immune system's reaction to the infection was the cause of death. Therefore, the majority of deaths from the virus were at the cost of those with strong immune systems, young adults. One theory made recently suggests the virus came from China. In 1918, Chinese health officials identified a respiratory illness in northern China from 1917 as synonymous with the Spanish flu. That virus from China would have spread through the 96,000 laborers sent to Europe through Canada, known as the Chinese Labor Corps. Reports of respiratory illness among the workers would have been the first outbreaks of influenza. In fact, about 3,000 laborers were eventually quarantined due to illness. Despite the uncertainty of the direct cause of the pandemic, we do know that every part of the globe was affected. The Spanish flu earned its name after the virus had traveled from France to Spain, in which was uninvolved in the war and was free of wartime censorship, meaning the new arrival of illness got more attention from the press. On July 22nd, after an outbreak of influenza at Fort Riley, Kansas, a few months prior, a bulletin about the Spanish flu was posted by the Philadelphia public health officials. The disease began to spread rapidly in America, and in early September, the Surgeon General of the Army, Dr. Victor Vaughn, sees horrific scenes that change his life after advancing near Boston to Camp Devens upon pressing orders. Dr. Vaughn reports, I saw hundreds of young stalwart men in uniform coming into the wards of the hospital, Every bed was full, yet others crowded in. The faces wore a bluish cast. A cough brought up a blood-stained sputum. In the morning, the dead bodies are stacked about the morgue like cordwood. Sixty-three men die just in the day of Vaughn's arrival. In just three weeks of falling victim to the flu, the French Polynesian island of Tahiti faces the death of 10% of their population. On September 13th, the U.S. Public Health Service's Surgeon General, Rupert Blue, prescribes healthful food, rest, aspirin, and salts of quinine for the ill to the press. Despite this announcement and a rapidly increasing number of those infected and dead, many cities face the epidemic with flat-out denial. The Health Commissioner of New York City, Royal S. Copeland, even announces the city is in no danger of an epidemic, no need for our people to worry. The Chief of San Francisco's Board of Health, Dr. William Hassler believed the city would remain untouched by the virus. On September 19, 1918, Surgeon General Blue sends a telegraph to the head health officer of each state requesting they immediately conduct a survey to determine the prevalence of influenza. In response, Dr. John Hurdy, Indiana's Secretary of Board of Health, telephoned the local health officials in each city requesting a report. Hurdy warned that the flu was highly contagious but stated that quarantine is impractical. In fall, the virus had reached Africa, India, and the Far East, and by the end of the pandemic in the U.S., about 0.5% of the population died. In other parts of the world, however, it was worse. Latin America faced 1% of their total population die. Africa witnessed 1.5% die. Asia lost 3.5%. India alone saw 20 million deaths, and Western Samoa faced 20% dead. William H. Sardo Jr. lived in Washington, D.C. in 1918 and fell ill as a child to the virus. Sardo's father owned William H. Sardo & Co. and was a funeral home director. Sardo Jr. witnessed a coffin shortage due to the virus and his father and others turning to soldiers to help dig thousands of graves. Sardo now gets a flu shot. Every year it is available. Due to the virus's nature to be more fatal to those in the 20s to 30s range, some children were orphaned. With the obvious conflict of the pandemic itself and the denial of high authorities, it begs the question, where is the compromise in all of this? In the case of the Spanish influenza's devastating pandemic, the compromises are the actions taken to hamper the spread of the virus. In this unique topic, not only can we find conflict leading to compromise, but faulty compromise leading to more conflict. 
For example, when authorities denied the severity of the pandemic to keep focus on the war and to keep citizens calm, they created a larger conflict by allowing the Spanish flu to arrive and claim citizens' lives. During the late 1800s, public health officials gained authority and greater control due to an increase in epidemiological work, better understanding of bacterial transmission, and public hygiene efforts such as sanitation and vaccination programs. Because of this, the new belief that humans had powers over nature was adopted. This belief was questioned and challenged during the ravage of the Spanish flu, as authorities began to realize there wasn't much they could do to halt the virus. Therefore, most actions made by higher authorities were simply preventative. The American Public Health Association, APHA, in the U.S. determined that non-essential meetings such as saloons, dance halls, and even public funerals were to be prohibited. To prevent overcrowding, the committee promoted the fluctuation in operating hours of stores, businesses, and factories. This affected citizens' lives both socially and also economically. Businesses relying on the customers to come to them obviously suffered. Despite his previous statements, Royal S. Copeland ordered businesses to go operate on shifts to prevent subway overcrowding. Due to an overflow of patients, many makeshift hospitals were created in some areas of the U.S., and due to health workers' shortage, some were ran by medical students rather than professionals. The issue of closing school was highly debated, and so it was simply up to cities to decide. In Massachusetts, the school board administration instructed students to follow many rules to prevent infection and spreading the virus. For example, changing from wet clothes immediately, staying warm, washing hands, and even gargling special elixirs to clear the throat and mouth. The health departments of Illinois and New York required quarantine of those infected until sickness subsided. Due to lack of facilities and medical workers, exclusively severe cases were to be hospitalized. This also implemented into military training camps, and therefore sometimes entire camps were quarantined. In Britain, measures were a bit milder, such as limiting the length of music hall performances and allowing time for ventilation. However, all public elementary schools were closed. In Switzerland, a state of panic arose after the suspension of theaters, cinemas, concerts, and shooting matches. In France, students with any symptoms, as well as their brothers or sisters, were dismissed from school. If 75% of the class was absent, school was put off for two weeks. APHA prompted legislation to urge people to limit sneezing and coughing and to cease the use of shared cups in the workplace. Gauze masks were widely used in the U.S. In San Francisco, they eventually became mandatory, and San Diego did the same in December. Hundreds of citizens were arrested for failure to wear a mask. Obey the laws and wear the gauze. Protect your jaws from septic paws. Became a popular rhyme to remember the importance of wearing a mask. Although vaccines were developed in naval hospitals and training stations in both Pennsylvania and San Francisco, they proved ineffective. This is because exposure to previous flu strains may provide a little protection against new ones, but in the case of the Spanish flu, the surface proteins of the virus were quite different, making antibodies less effective and increasing the chance of infection. Home remedies also sprung up, including the brand Vicks to become a household name thanks to their vapor rub that is still commonly used today to combat some symptoms of the flu. Whiskey, onions, and quinine medicines were believed to treat or cure the flu. In reality, these solutions just help with the symptoms of the flu and couldn't actually cure you. The Spanish flu finally came to an end at approximately the summer of 1919, as those who had caught it either died or developed an immunity. The Spanish flu came mysteriously and departed in the same manner, leaving its trail of destruction behind. It created a sense of isolation among people, fearing that interaction could lead to their own death. Sardo Jr. even stated that it took a couple of years for the anxiety just to fade away and for people to congregate again. From the Spanish flu, one can conclude that the events that occurred are truly horrific, and it is astonishing that despite its importance, the pandemic has been forgotten. The Spanish influenza seems to be a reminder from nature that though we may be powerful people, we have little control and knowledge of even our own planet. Nevertheless, we must realize the importance of acknowledging the arrival of disease and acting fast, for just as the victims of the Spanish flu, we could be here one day and absent the next. While the Great War acted as a diversion from the coming of the Spanish influenza, let us re be reminded to always stay alert and keep watch.